The Contest In the year of our Lord, 66, the Emperor Nero, being at that time in the twenty-ninth year of his life and the thirteenth of his reign, set sail for Greece with the strangest company and the most singular design that any monarch has ever entertained. With ten galleys he went forth from Puteoli, carrying with him great stores of painted scenery and theatrical properties, together with a number of knights and senators whom he feared to leave behind him at Rome, and who were all marked for death in the course of his wanderings. In his train he took Nartus, his singing coach, Cluvius, a man with a monstrous voice, who should bawl out his titles, and a thousand trained youths who had learned to applaud in unison whenever their master sang or played in public. So deftly had they been taught that each had his own role to play. Some did no more than give forth a low, deep hum of speechless appreciation, some clapped with enthusiasm, some, rising from approbation into absolute frenzy, shrieked, stamped, and beat sticks upon the benches, some, and they were the most effective, had learned from an Alexandrian a long, droning, musical note which they all uttered together, so that it boomed over the assembly. With the aid of these mercenary admirers, Nero had every hope, in spite of his indifferent voice and clumsy execution, to return to Rome, bearing with him the chaplets for song, offered for free competition by the Greek cities. As his great gilded galley, with two tiers of oars, passed down the Mediterranean, the emperor sat in his cabin all day, his teacher by his side, rehearsing from morning to night those compositions which he had selected, whilst every few hours a Nubian slave massaged the imperial throat with oil and balsam, that it might be ready for the great ordeal which lay before it in the land of poetry and song. His food, his drink, and his exercise were prescribed for him as for an athlete who trains for a contest, and the twanging of his lyre with the strident notes of his voice resounded continually from the imperial quarters. Now it chanced that there lived in those days a Grecian goat herd named Polycles, who tended and partly owned a great flock, which grazed upon the long flanks of the hills near Heria, which is five miles north of the river Alpheus, and no great distance from the famous Olympia. This person was noted over all the countryside as a man of strange gifts and singular character, he was a poet who had twice been crowned for his verses, and he was a musician to whom the use and sound of an instrument were so natural that one would more easily meet him without his staff than his harp. Even in his lonely vigils on the winter hills, he would bear it always slung over his shoulder and would pass the long hours by its aid, so that it had come to be part of his very self, he was beautiful also, swarthy and eager, with a head like Adonis, and in strength there was no one who could compete with him. But all was ruined by his disposition, which was so masterful that he would brook no opposition nor contradiction. For this reason he was continually at enmity with all his neighbours, and in his fits of temper he would spend months at a time in his stone hut among the mountains, hearing nothing from the world, and living only for his music and his goats. One spring morning, in the year of 67, Polycles, with the aid of his boy Dorus, had driven his goats over to a new pasturage, which overlooked from afar the town of Olympia. Gazing down upon it from the mountain, the shepherd was surprised to see that a portion of the famous amphitheatre had been roofed in, as though some performance was being enacted. Living far from the world and from all news, Polycles could not imagine what was afoot. 
for he was well aware that the Grecian games were not due for two years to come. Surely some poetic or musical contest must be proceeding, of which he had heard nothing. If so, there would perhaps be some chance of his gaining the votes of the judges. And in any case, he loved to hear the compositions and admire the execution of the great minstrels who assembled on such an occasion. Calling to Doris, therefore, he left the goats to his charge and strode swiftly away, his harp upon his back, to see what was going forward in the town. When Polycles came into the suburbs, he found them deserted, but he was still more surprised when he reached the main street to see no single human being in the place. He hastened his steps, therefore, and as he approached the theatre, he was conscious of a low, sustained hum, which announced the concourse of a huge assembly. Never in all his dreams had he imagined any musical competition upon so vast a scale as this. There were some soldiers clustering outside the door, but Polycles pushed his way swiftly through them, and found himself upon the outskirts of the multitude, who filled the great space formed by roofing over a portion of the national stadium. Looking around him, Polycles saw a great number of his neighbours, whom he knew by sight, tightly packed upon the benches, all with their eyes fixed upon the stage. He also observed that there were soldiers round the walls, and that a considerable part of the hall was filled by a body of youths of foreign aspect, with white gowns and long hair. All this he perceived, but what it meant he could not imagine. He bent over to a neighbour to ask him, but a soldier prodded him at once with the butt-end of his spear, and commanded him fiercely to hold his peace. The man whom he had addressed, thinking that Polycles had demanded a seat, pressed closer to his neighbour, and so the shepherd found himself sitting at the end of the bench which was nearest to the door. Thence he concentrated himself upon the stage, on which Metas, a well-known minstrel from Corinth, and an old friend of Polycles, was singing and playing without much encouragement from the audience. To Polycles it seemed that Metas was having less than his due, so he applauded loudly but he was surprised to observe that the soldiers frowned at him and that all his neighbours regarded him with some surprise. Being a man of strong and obstinate character, he was the more inclined to persevere in his clapping when he perceived that the general sentiment was against him. But what followed filled the shepherd poet with absolute amazement. When Metas of Corinth had made his bow, and withdrawn to half-hearted and perfunctory applause, there appeared upon the stage, amid the wildest enthusiasm upon the part of the audience, a most extraordinary figure. He was a short, fat man, neither old nor young, with a bull neck and a round, heavy face which hung in creases in front, like the dewlap of an ox. He was absurdly clad in a short blue tunic, braced at the waist with a golden belt. His neck and part of his chest were exposed, and his short fat legs were bare from the buskins below to the middle of his thighs, which was as far as his tunic extended. In his hair were two golden wings, and the same upon his heels, after the fashion of the god Mercury. Behind him walked a negro bearing a harp, and beside him a richly dressed officer who bore rolls of music. This strange creature took the harp from the hands of the attendant and advanced to the front of the stage, whence he bowed and smiled to the cheering audience. This is some foppish singer from Athens, thought Polycles to himself but at the same time he understood that only a great master of song could receive such a reception from a Greek audience. This was evidently some wonderful performer whose reputation had preceded him. Polycles settled down, therefore, and prepared to give his soul up to the music. 
the blue-clad player struck several chords upon his lyre and then burst suddenly out into the ode of Niobe. Polycles sat straight up on his bench and gazed at the stage in amazement. The tune demanded a rapid transition from a low note to a high and had been purposely chosen for this reason. The low note was a grunting, a rumble, the deep, discordant growling of an ill-conditioned dog. Then suddenly the singer threw up his face, straightened his tubby figure, rose upon his tiptoes, and with wagging head and scarlet cheeks, emitted such a howl as the same dog might have given had his growl been checked by a kick from his master. All the while the lyre twanged and thrummed, sometimes in front of and sometimes behind the voice of the singer. And what amazed Polycles most of all was the effect of this performance upon the audience. Every Greek was a trained critic, and as unsparing in his hisses as he was lavish in his applause. Many a singer far better than this absurd fop had been driven amid execration and abuse from the platform. But now, as the man stopped and wiped the abundant sweat from his fat face, the whole assembly burst into a delirium of appreciation. The shepherd held his hands to his bursting head and felt that his reason must be leaving him. It was surely a dreadful musical nightmare, and he would wake soon and laugh at the remembrance. But no. The figures were real, the faces were those of his neighbours, the cheers which resounded in his ears were indeed from an audience which filled the theatre of Olympia. The whole chorus was in full blast, the hummers humming, the shouters bellowing, the tappers hard at work upon the benches, while every now and then came a musical cyclone of incomparable, divine, from the trained phalanx who intoned their applause their united voices sweeping over the tumult as the drone of the wind dominates the roar of the sea. It was madness, insufferable madness. If this were allowed to pass, there was an end of all musical justice in Greece. Polycles' conscience would not permit him to be still. Standing upon his bench with waving hands and upraised voice, he protested with all the strength of his lungs against the mad judgment of the audience. At first, amid the tumult, his action was hardly noticed. His voice was drowned in the universal roar which broke out afresh at each bow and smirk from the fatuous musician. But gradually the folk round Polycles ceased clapping and stared at him in astonishment. The silence grew in ever-widening circles until the whole great assembly sat mute, staring at this wild and magnificent creature who was storming at them from his perch near the door. Fools, he cried, what are you clapping at? What are you cheering? Is this what you call music? Is this catcalling to earn an Olympian prize? The fellow has not a note in his voice. You are either deaf or mad. And I for one cry shame upon you for your folly. Soldiers ran to pull him down and the whole audience was in confusion, some of the bolder cheering the sentiments of the shepherd, and others crying that he should be cast out of the building. Meanwhile, the successful singer, having handed his lyre to his negro attendant, was inquiring from those around him on the stage as to the cause of the uproar. Finally, a herald, with an enormously powerful voice, stepped forward to the front and proclaimed that if the foolish person at the back of the hall, who appeared to differ from the opinion of the rest of the audience, would come forward upon the platform, he might, if he dared, exhibit his own powers and see if he could outdo the admirable and wonderful exhibition which they had just had the privilege of hearing. Polycles sprang readily to his feet at the challenge, and the great company making way for him to pass, he found himself a minute later standing in his unkempt garb, with his frayed and weather-beaten harp in his hand before the expectant crowd. He stood for a moment tightening a string here and slackening another there until his chords rang true. 
Then, amid a murmur of laughter and jeers from the Roman benches immediately before him, he began to sing. He had prepared no composition, but he had trained himself to improvise, singing out of his heart for the joy of the music. He told of the land of Elis, beloved of Jupiter, in which they were gathered that day, of the great bare mountain slopes, of the swift shadows of the clouds, of the winding blue river, of the keen air of the uplands, of the chill of the evenings, and the beauties of earth and sky. It was all simple and childlike, but it went to the hearts of the Olympians, for it spoke of the land which they knew and loved. Yet when he at last dropped his hand, few of them dared to applaud, and their feeble voices were drowned by a storm of hisses and groans from his opponents. He shrank back in horror from so unusual a reception, and in an instant his blue-clad rival was in his place. If he had sung badly before, his performance was now inconceivable. His screams, his grunts, his discords and harsh, jarring cacophonies were an outrage to the very name of music, and yet, every time that he paused for breath or to wipe his streaming forehead, a fresh thunder of applause came rolling back from the audience. Polycles sank his face in his hands and prayed that he might not be insane. Then, when the dreadful performance ceased and the uproar of admiration showed that the crown was certainly awarded to this impostor, a horror of the audience, a hatred of this race of fools, and a craving for the peace and silence of the pastures mastered every feeling in his mind. He dashed through the mass of people waiting at the wings and emerged in the open air. His old rival and friend, Metas of Corinth, was waiting there with an anxious face. Quick, Polycles, quick, he cried. My pony is tethered beyond yonder grove. A grey he is, with red trappings, get you gone as hard as hoof will bear you, for if you are taken you will have no easy death. No easy death? What mean you, Metas? Who is that fellow? Great Jupiter, did you not know? Where have you lived? It is Nero, the emperor. Never would he pardon what you have said about his voice. Quick, man, quick, or the guards will be at your heels. An hour later the shepherd was well on his way to his mountain home, and about the same time the emperor, having received the chaplet of Olympia for the incomparable excellence of his performance, was making inquiries with a frowning brow as to who the insolent person might be who had dared to utter such contemptuous criticisms. "'Bring him to me here this instant,' said he, and let Marcus with his knife and branding iron be in attendance. If it please you, great Caesar, said Arsenius Platus, the officer of attendance, the man cannot be found, and there are some very strange rumours flying about. Rumours? cried the angry Nero. What do you mean, Arsenius? I tell you that the fellow was an ignorant upstart with the bearing of a boar and the voice of a peacock. I tell you also that there are a good many who are as guilty as he among the people, for I heard them with my own ears raise cheers for him when he had sung his ridiculous ode. I have half a mind to burn their town about their ears so that they may remember my visit. It is not to be wondered at if he won their votes, Caesar, said the soldier, for from what I hear, it would have been no disgrace had you, even you, been conquered in this contest. I conquered? You are mad, Arsenius. What do you mean? None know him, great Caesar. He came from the mountains, and he disappeared into the mountains. You marked the wildness and strange beauty of his face. It is whispered, that for once the great god Pan has condescended to measure himself against a mortal. The cloud cleared from Nero's brow. Of course, Arsenius, you are right. 
no man would have dared to brave me so. What a story for Rome. Let the messenger leave this very night, Arsenius, to tell them how their emperor has upheld their honour in Olympia this day. That is the end of The Contest by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Read by Greg Wagland for Magpie Audio, 2021.